Hey, we are so glad that you could join us for the online service today. We love having your company. We love being together. We love enjoying Jesus together and listening to his word and praying for you and enjoying all the good things of heaven on earth today. Let's praise him and enjoy together as we sing The Battle Belongs to the Lord.
I wrote a song many years ago and it was, it's a crazy, crazy world that we're living in. Well, that is maybe more appropriate now than it ever was. <laughs> yes, it certainly is a good time to pray and yep. to seek God in the midst of shouting out his word everywhere we go. So we want to pray for you today. So let's open our hearts right now. Let's turn on our faith. Let's get focused on heaven. And remember, you and I, we all have a great invitation from God to come with boldness mm. to his throne right now and to let your petitions be made known to God. Yeah, because he is the one that loves you more than anyone else. He loves you so much. He thinks you're amazing. And he cares about what you're going through right now. So let's pray. Thank Father, you. we thank you today mm. that you are with us. Yeah. We thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit, the name of Jesus, yeah. the blood of the Lamb, forgiveness of sins, a new birth, the righteousness of God, and a high priest at the right hand of God today. And as we pray in Jesus' name, mm. we thank you, Father, that you said, and if he hears you, then you know that you have the requests that you have asked of him. And we're asking today, Father, for you to move in all of our lives and to bring to pass everything that we believe for, everything that we declare in your name and bring it to pass through the power of the Holy Spirit and the work of your angels in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I'm praying for somebody who's been getting foot cramps at night time. And in the name of Jesus right now, we stand against those foot cramps. Mm -hmm. We stand against any cause of it that it would be resolved. And we command that pain to cease and that every one of us, including the person fighting off those cramps, could come under the power of the word of God that says he gives his beloved sleep in Jesus name. Father, I pray for those suffering with cancer at the moment. I stand against cancer in the name of Jesus. We declare that by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. And we stand against every cancerous cell, command it to shrivel up and die in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And Father, anybody that's suffering with COVID symptoms or symptoms of bad effects from the jab, we pray for them today, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would work and effect a great healing in their yes, life. Thank you, and that everyone that we know or are concerned about, whether it's in Australia or overseas, that they would receive healing and that they would be completely restored to full health in Jesus' name. Those suffering from inability to sleep, Father, we pray right now and declare that you Give your beloved sleep. I pray for peace in the midst of the storm. Amen. I thank you, Lord. We stand against insomnia and just other issues that are causing people to have disturbed sleep. We pray right now for healing, for mm. peace, and that ability to sleep peacefully in Jesus' name. Somebody's been experiencing stomach cramps. That's not very nice. And in the name of Jesus, we rebuke those cramps we stand against that in Jesus' name and we declare that that situation would be resolved and anything that needs healing be healed, anything that needs to be changed would be changed and that great freedom and release would come. Stomach cramps, we command you to leave this scenario and go from it in Jesus' name. Pray for someone today with a sore throat. We command that pain to go in Jesus' name. Infection, inflammation leaves right now in Jesus' name pain leaves. Thank you. There's somebody with a problem right down the back of your hand and it goes from really the wrist down to the knuckle joints. And I pray right now that whatever that problem is, we just declare complete healing over that, a complete restoration from that problem in the name of Jesus. And we claim for that person complete healing, complete restoration and complete freedom from the anxiety, the worry and the concern that it brings in the name of Jesus. Yep, thank you, Lord. There's somebody watching and you have a growth inside your mouth. That's the only word I've got. And in Jesus' name, we command that growth to go down for that scenario and that situation to be reversed and for a complete healing and restoration in the name of the Lord Jesus thank Christ. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Receive that healing right now. Mm -hmm. Receive that healing. Just look to God, thank receive you. it in your spirit first Thank him for it. 
praise him for it so that it can be manifested into the natural realm in Jesus' name. Others, and we may not have named what you're going through, but we pray mm. right now for every symptom, every bit of pain, every sickness in the name of Jesus. Thank we you, command it to leave. We pray for healing. We thank you, Lord, that by your stripes we were healed and Amen. we declare healing Amen. now thank in your you. physical body. Thank you, Lord. I'm praying for someone today and you've got gifts from God, you've, you're gifted, but you're not doing anything or you don't know what to do. I've got to say to you in the name of Jesus, this came like a word of knowledge, that God is saying the world needs the gift that I have put in you. Mm -hmm. And in Jesus' name, Father, I pray for that person, number one, that they would have confidence in what you've put in them. Okay. And number two, that you would open up doors for them, effective doors mm -hmm. to use their gift open up people with receptive and open hearts and lives and minds that you would connect them with. And Father, that you would also bring around them or connect them with somebody that can help move them forward and get them into the place they need to be in God, in Jesus' name. And I pray for those that need God's provision at this time. I thank you, Lord, that our needs are met in you. And we declare that provision coming in Thank you, Lord, our needs being met through your provision. Thank you, Father. And Father, we pray right now for the salvation of loved ones, of family members, of acquaintances, of work fellows, people we've met on the internet. We just pray today, Father, for a supernatural flow of salvation that the gospel will be released and find its target in the hearts of men and women who haven't yet received the new birth, that a great surging forward of the kingdom of God through new souls being saved would take place through the people we know and the ones that we're in contact with in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's open our hearts to God right now in worship and let's just believe that we receive what we've prayed for. Yeah. Start to see your friends, your family getting saved as we worship God together right now.
Some of us don't realize that we are in the midst of a fight for our freedom, a fight for life as it has been. If we don't fight for what we have, we will live to regret what we lose. We must continue this two-punch fight, as someone said, prayer and pushback of the evil that is trying to prevail, not against any person. There are certain things in this fight that only God can do, and He needs our prayers to see these things achieved. Right now, we need the church to be in unity and together fighting our common enemy. The subtle and not so subtle division is detrimental to our cause. The church is based on unity, a group of people willingly committed to a common cause or a common goal. 
Where there is unity, God commands the blessing. He says how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. In the book of John, Jesus prays for the church that we all may be one, that the world may believe. We can live differently. James warns that where there is envy and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. Our goal is to demonstrate God's love and unity in action. We will become one when we pray and God manifests His glory. Despite all of our differences and uniquenesses, we do have a common goal, which is to see His glory. And this needs to outweigh our differences. It's time to put love into action. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples when you have love one for another. We are disciples of Jesus. It's time to combine our unique gifts and stand together with a united front to fight our common enemy. As we dwell in unity, God's anointing flows to the body. As a strong, courageous, united body, we fight against our common enemy who comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. We aim at working together to achieve God's purpose. His Spirit dwells in us and among us to help us achieve this. He helps us to come together despite our differences. God created us with our uniqueness, not that there would be conflict, but that a little of Him would shine through each of us. The world should see a living example of a group of vastly different human beings working together with cooperation, unity and a great love for one another. It is then that we'll be able to fight with a united front. We cannot lose our freedom. What we give up now, we will not get back. Our priority is to pray, stand in unity 
and perhaps write to those in power and peaceably, with respect, stand for what we believe. The world does not know it, but they need the church to shine its light and hold back the darkness. Together we stand, divided we fall. Let's continue to fight the fight of faith. Spirit sound, rushing wind, fire of God, fall within, Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent, turn from sin, revival embers smoldering, breath of God, fan us into flame. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit Spirit out, pour your spirit out. 
the growing church and kingdom through Acts. Today we're up to part seven, where Jesus spread and multiplied the living word of God through his disciples with a little help from angels. So today our key scriptures are found in the latter part of Acts. We've got Acts 6, 7, the word of God spread. We've got Acts 12, 24, the word of God grew and multiplied. And Acts 19, 20, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Let's pray. Father, as we look at your word today, we're asking again, Father, that you would fill us with your spirit of wisdom and revelation, that the eyes of our understanding might be open, that you would flood our inner sight with light from heaven, that we would be flooded with revelation and understanding of exactly what the word of God means, and also the wisdom, the insight and vision for today of exactly how to apply it collectively, how to apply it individually in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're looking at how did Jesus accelerate church and kingdom growth. This week, he spread and multiplied the living word of God through his disciples. The living word of a king, when that word prevails, the king's kingdom is prevailing or dominating or it's his domain, you could say. Amen. So we're going to follow this through now, the book of Acts, and to see exactly how this worked on the ground so that we can learn how to put it into our lives and then how to reapply it in our situation, whether it be at the workplace and at the home, in church life, in a ministry, and wherever you are in the world, on the mission field, this principle can be taken out of the historic setting and understanding the difference between history and culture and geography and the essence of what's written here and then reapplying it in our geography, in our culture, in our language and in our contemporary times. Amen. So it says here in Acts chapter 6 verse 7 where we left off in the previous couple of sessions, the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. We're focusing on this spreading of the word of God. And it says a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Verse eight. And Stephen, one of the magnificent seven deacons, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Amen. So there's that pattern again. Sign and a wonder, the word of God, growth and addition persecution. Amen. And so what we see here is because of the trouble, they sorted it out. Stephen starts to do signs and wonders. And then, of course, here comes the pressure of the enemy who hates God. He hates us who are made in the image of God. And he hates it when the word of God gets out because the word of God means God's kingdom's coming to challenge his and heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. You could say it like this, the kingdom of heaven forcefully advances, but then it undergoes a forceful counterattack from the enemy. And that's exactly what we see here. So in Acts chapter six, verse nine, that's the next verse. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. So it starts off with a dispute stirred up by the enemy. Obviously, if it wasn't the enemy, they would have listened to the word of God and submitted to it. Amen. Verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spoke, which is an interesting thing about our times. If people engage with us sincerely and want to have a, a logical reason discussion about truth and about the way things are, there will come a logical reasoned outcome. But when people start calling you names and they don't engage, it's almost like they're saying, we've got no logical reasoned argument against you so we will accuse you and call you names 
to try to put you off and they'll name you all kinds of things these days. It's the pattern the world system is using against its enemies. Amen. So they were unable to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Again, it's the enemy. It's deception because it wasn't true. And it's accusation straight from the pit of hell. Verse 12. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, that's Stephen, seized him and brought him to the council. It's amazing how lack of content is followed with deception, lies and accusations, name calling, anything but debating the truth. And then it ends up with arrest and going to court. We are seeing the same patterns today. And we need to be aware and understand how Jesus, the head of the church, had his people, his church, his disciples, his ruling council, how he had them respond to the very scenario which we are facing. So we're about to see Stephen's response to the council. Remember, they've arrested him and he has to stand before the council to give an account. How does he respond? He responds with the living word of God. Jesus uses Stephen to keep spreading the king's word and commands and edicts and truth. Amen. So it's Acts 6, 15. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Now, as you move over into Acts chapter 7, then the high priest said, are these things so? And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. And then Stephen begins this amazing long speech in the Holy Ghost, which was full of download from heaven. It is the word of God because it's in the Bible. And he spoke this to the council and his accusers. He starts like this. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. He goes on then and talks about the call of Abraham. He goes through the history all the way to the patriarchs who couldn't survive the famine without going to Egypt, where Joseph had been sent ahead of them by God to get everything ready, sustain them. They were there 400 or so years. And after that, God raised up Moses. And Stephen's building up to something because he said, in just the same way that our fathers refused to listen to Moses when he first came to them and they didn't want him to rule over them. The same thing has happened about Jesus. He is from God. He's the son of God. He's the Christ, the Messiah. And you have said no to him. Amen. So he goes on to talk about Israel rebels against God in Moses day. Israel keeps resisting the Holy Spirit because remember, 12 spies going to the promised land, 10 of them say it's no good. They turn the people back. It was a disaster. And then as we read this story, we're down to verse 54 now in Acts chapter 7, reading on. And when they heard these things, so the council are listening and they hear all of this word of God coming to them. They were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Now, this is a wrong response. They were cut to the heart means conviction because they wanted their position. They wanted their power. They wanted their income. They wanted their place. They wanted their respect and their honor. And then a man full of the Holy Spirit comes and speaks God's word to them and it cuts them to the heart because nobody else can get there but the word of God and God, the Holy Spirit. But instead of responding in repentance, they want to shut down the voice of God. This is no different, whether it's coming from religious leaders, from rulers and systems in the world or from lost people around us. There's a response that comes right out of the heart of the devil and we have to be aware of it and awake to it. Amen. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see heavens open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried with a loud voice, stop their ears. 
And they ran at him with one accord, trying to stop the word of God getting in. That's what they thought. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, listen, listen to what he says. First of all, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down while they're killing him for refusing to hear the word that he preached. And this is what he said. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Amen. He was ushered straight into the presence of God after having become the first Christian martyr, following in Jesus' footsteps. So what happened was, Stephen is full of the word of God, full of the Holy Spirit, given a responsibility, looking up the tables, does signs and wonders, has to deal with the onslaught of the enemy. First of all, people trying to dispute. He overcomes that because at least they're doing an argument. Then he has to put up with the liars and the accusers. They drag him to the council. Then he speaks the word of God, which convicts them so deeply that they refuse to hear it. They shut their ears dragged him out and stoned him. Of course, we do feel something for Stephen because he was a martyr, but for all eternity, he will wear the martyr's crown and forever live in the gratitude of God for what he did in spreading the word of God. Amen. And helping to promote the propagation of God's kingdom. So now we're up to Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, this is, this is really, really clever. Because remember, the king is looking to get his word out there and see it prevail. Watch what happens. It doesn't matter what the enemy tries. God is a genius. He is so much smarter than the enemy. We could say infinitely smarter. And he is able to work all of these things for good because of his superiority. Now, Saul consented to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. What did Jesus say to them? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. All right. And they were all scattered because of the persecution. Whose will's getting done? Nobody likes persecution. But now people full of the word of God, yoked to Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, are scattering. Amen. They're going in every direction. Kind of reminds me of a funny story because when I was a young boy, no, young boy, boy, growing up on the farm, one day I noticed a spider walking along and it had a big ball attached to its back or its abdomen. And I looked at that. And of course, as a young boy, just remember, young boy, I thought, I wonder what happens if I kill it. So I hit it. I didn't realize that that big ball on its back was actually like a big sack full of baby spiders. So when I hit it, little spiders ran everywhere. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And it's the same with Jesus. When they killed him, little Jesuses ran everywhere. And when they killed Stephen, they start scattering the people that are full of the word of God, which is the most dangerous thing that ever happened to the devil's kingdom. Amen. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea. Because Jesus said, you're going to preach the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the world. Up to this time, it'll be a lot of focus on Jerusalem. But now the word's going. Amen. Jesus spreads the word of God through the scattering. I love that. And I'm going to read verse four again. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Now, what did Jesus say in his commission? I'm reading from Mark 16, 15 to 20. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. All the world, everyone. D, Jesus spread the word through Philip preaching at Samaria. This is an important historic event in the church. So Acts 8 verses 4 to 8. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Of course, 
Jesus had talked to the woman at the well there. She got people out of that city. They came out and listened to Jesus and they believed him. But now the gospel is getting there through Philip. Verse six, crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Now think about this. Jesus said, I only do what I see with my father. The works that I do are not mine, but the father who's in me, he does the works. Jesus was seeing things with the father and then he was imitating them so that other people could see in the natural realm what Jesus was seeing with Father God in the spirit realm. And it's the same with hearing. Jesus heard, he spoke. And now we see that Philip is doing the exact same thing as Jesus. He's going there, he's preaching the message which he has received by revelation and it's often for us when we hear the gospel, it sticks and we can share it straight away. That's not a problem. And he's doing miracles, which we do by seeing in the spirit and hearing from God. Amen. So he's putting from the spirit realm into the natural realm, something for others to hear and see. So the principle is we go into the spirit realm to God. We hear things from God. We see things from God, which are always in line with the word of God and most probably come while we're meditating or reading the word of God, meditating in the word of God or reading the word of God. We're studying it, analyzing it. Then we do and say what we've seen and heard. Amen. Verse seven, many evil spirits were cast out screaming as they left their victims and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Amen. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty and in God's presence is fullness of joy. So this joy coming into Samaria was because God was present and he got to be present through the believers, their obedience and the preaching of God's word, the declaring of the truth and the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Then in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, and it said, Now the people believed Philip's message. By the way, none of this works unless they believe it. The Sanhedrin heard the message. They didn't believe it. Jesus went down to Nazareth and there he preached, but he couldn't do any mighty miracles because of their unbelief. They didn't believe it. So verse 12 again. Now the people believe Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized because Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Amen. So we can see that Jesus used Philip to spread the word into the city of Samaria, including, of course, the other disciples who were scattered went into the region of Samaria as well. We're up to E. Jesus spread the word through Peter and John in Samaria and then in a whole lot of other villages. So this thing Jesus is doing is really working. Amen. We know we're not happy about the persecution and the murders, but we are happy about the word of God spreading. So in Acts chapter 8, verse 18 to 25, when Simon, now Simon the sorcerer was there, he heard the word of God. He used to sway the crowds with his sorcery, but now he's hearing the truth of the gospel. He's seeing Peter and John coming and laying hands on people and they're being filled with the Holy Spirit. He makes a mistake. He wants to buy that power, not really getting hold of what's going on. So when Simon saw that the spirit was given, when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Verse 19, let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, but Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and held captive 
by sin. Notice, Peter released the word of God to him. Verse 24, Simon's response. Pray to the Lord for me, Simon exclaimed, that these terrible things you've said won't happen to me. Just a note that when anybody gets saved, whether it's a greatest sports star, the greatest music hero, whether it's somebody that's relatively famous or just a nobody, everybody starts in the kingdom of God as a baby. Don't lift up the people that are in the spotlight too quickly when they get saved, because as we all know, many of them turn around and drop it and go back. We've had famous football player in Australia, got saved. How long did he last? They get saved as famous people, but they are thrown into the limelight. Everybody gives them money for their testimony, but it doesn't last because each one of us has to start as a baby. And we have to be grounded in the Word of God and go through long processes. I may have mentioned that scripture last week where the Word of God came to test us. We all go through the fire of tests and trials so that our faith can be purified, so that we can come into trusting Jesus as Lord and we can go on to being yoked with Him as disciples. There's no shortcuts in this. We have to grow from a baby spiritually to maturity spiritually. It takes time. It takes spiritual exercise and spiritual nutrition and focus and staying with it. Amen. So Simon couldn't get there overnight, no matter how much money changed hands. Amen. Verse 25, after testifying and preaching the word of the Lord in Samaria, so Jesus is using Peter and John to get the word out, to follow up on Philip's evangelism, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem and they stopped in many Samaritan villages along the way to preach the good news. Is the word spreading? Absolutely. Is it having a result? Definitely. It's having a result in evangelism and in apostolic authority, sorting out problems and bringing things into the right order in Jesus' name. We're up to F now. Jesus spread and multiplied the word through Philip preaching and it spread all the way to Ethiopia. Let me explain as we read. Now in Acts 8, 26 to 40, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise, go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. Well, that's a good heads up for all of us. Philip's a disciple. He's yoked to Jesus. He's hearing from the head of the church through the Holy Spirit and he gives him an instruction to which he immediately responds and obeys. Amen. This is a big part of this. Hallelujah. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, that's none of our business, of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury. So he was the treasurer of the nation's money. Amen. And had come down to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. He's the right guy. He's been getting the word of God in. He just needs some revelation from somebody who knows the gospel. Amen. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Verse 29. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. He wasn't rebellious against God or he might have said no. <laughs> so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? Now, a good evangelist can start anywhere and preach Jesus. You watch what happens. Verse 31, the eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? 
Then Philip opened his mouth. Here comes the word of God straight by revelation from heaven. God opens a door for the gospel. He starts where the man's reading and preaches the gospel. Read this. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus. Verse 36. Now, as they went down the road, they came near some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And then he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And so Philip's preaching must have preached Jesus, the Christ, the son of God and ended at baptism. Amen. Verse 38. So he commanded the chariot to stand still and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. I love that. The word of God's now been pumped into this man. He's got the written word. He's heard the preacher. He's received the new birth, the baptism. He's a full on follower of Jesus now. So Jesus now has a firebrand plucked out of the fire, loaded on a chariot to go right into the heart of Ethiopia and possibly one of the top positions there with the opportunity to spread the word of God. Amen. Is Jesus' kingdom expanding on earth? Absolutely it is. Amen. And I'm excited. Verse 39. Now, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. The joy in the eunuch can only be evidence of the presence of God. Verse 40. But Philip was found at Azotus and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. The word of God continues to spread. Amen. So far, we've seen the word of God spread after the persecution of Stephen, where it went into the council. Then it spread to Samaria and villages, to Ethiopia, Azotus and cities. And it can spread where you are right now, to your neighbours, to your family. It can spread into all kinds of people and never underestimate what one convert can do. So always share the word of God. Amen. They don't get saved off our arguments. They don't get saved off our ideas. They don't get saved off reading the newspaper, watching the television, unless they're watching Christian preachers. They don't get saved out of magazines. They don't get saved out of us being a good bloke or even mowing their lawn, which is good. But they get saved when they hear the word of God. The Bible instructs us, preach the word in season and out of season. Amen. Keep preaching the word. And the centurion said to Jesus, speak the word only. Amen. And we have to remember that. I was teaching in Bible college one day and, and there's a student at the back going like this. And he kept asking me, Dave, what's your opinion on this? Dave, what's your opinion on that every few minutes? And after a while, I looked him in the eye and I said, nobody here is interested in my opinion. I'm not even interested in my opinion. We only want the opinion of Jesus. And of course, we want his word. He's watching over his word to perform it. He never said he would watch over my word to perform it. And if you read that passage in Mark very carefully, where he sent them out, it says they went everywhere preaching the word of God and the Lord working with and confirming the word with signs following. The signs and wonders and healing and miracles do not confirm the person that they were preached through. Amen. Any more than the crowds at Jerusalem confirmed that the donkey was a genius when Jesus was riding on his back. The crowds were there putting down palm branches for Jesus. And when signs and wonders happen through you, it confirms Jesus, not me, not you. And people need to hear his word. Amen. G in Acts 9. Saul was converted, the persecutor, and became Paul, the apostle. Let's read about that. Acts 9, verses 1 to 43. Then Saul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters for the synagogues of Damascus. To cut a long story short, he's walking along the road. He sees a light from heaven. It speaks of, again, the same kind of thing, the eunuch, reading the word of God, he needed someone with revelation to show him how that word works and how it works in his life. 
Saul of Tarsus was the most educated man. He sat as a Pharisee at the feet of Gamaliel, a noted teacher in Jerusalem, and he learned the word. But just having the lifeless word, remember he said himself, Paul said, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. He had the letter. And what does it make him do? Persecute Christians. Persecutes the followers of the Lord. But then when he got the light from heaven, which speaks of he needs a second part to this. Having the word in your life is good, but you need some revelation to mix with it, a revelation of that word. And suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice. That's a second way of saying it. Amen. Saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? That's the third thing here, that whoever is speaking to him is the boss and he better do what he says. And then Paul's first prayer is this to Jesus. Lord, what do you want me to do? That's in verse six. And the Lord gives him instructions going to the city. He's three days without sight. You may go through things that take time for the result to come. Like this COVID crisis, we've got to just keep at what we are believing and confessing. Keep praying, keep on the word of God, because it doesn't matter how long it takes. It will happen. And prophesying the end times, we read in the book of Daniel that it says that the enemy was given power to prevail against the saints of God until judgment was given for them. It can take time, especially in such a significant moment as we are in right now. Now, Paul's inside Damascus now. He's waiting for three days. Meanwhile, Jesus speaks to a disciple there called Ananias. He sent him around to where Paul was. He laid hands on him. His sight came back. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it says that Jesus used him to spread the word. Here I'm reading from verse 19 now. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Verse 20, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that is the son of God. And of course he goes on, keeps preaching. He writes in the New Testament and he writes all of these great letters full of revelation from heaven. And it would never have happened if he had just stayed in the written word. It would have made him a persecutor of true believers. So if you're a true believer today, don't be surprised that persecution will come against you from those who know the written word, but they are not living in that intimate, personal, one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus, not yoked to him as disciples, not filled with the Holy Spirit, living by faith, getting light and the voice from heaven to bring the word of God alive so that they can speak it, so that they can live it and so that they can follow in Jesus' footsteps. Amen. And if you haven't made that change, if you haven't yet received Jesus' new birth, we're going to pray a prayer right now. And Jesus, if you pray this prayer and really mean it with all your heart, he says you will be born again. You can receive him as your savior, as your Lord, and you can walk in his footsteps, follow him, listen to his voice, be filled with his spirit and walk in his ways from this point forward. So to be born again today, repeat this prayer after me. And remember, say it to God, say this. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I turn from my old life. I repent of all of my sinful ways. I believe, Lord Jesus, that you rose from the dead and I receive you today as my Saviour. I confess you are my Lord I receive your new birth and I receive your Holy Spirit by your grace and through the work of your spirit. I will follow you from this day forward, being yoked to you as a true disciple of Jesus. Thank you that my name's now in the Lamb's Book of Life and that one day I'm going to go with you when I leave this planet. I'm asking in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, God bless you. Thanks for listening. If you said that prayer, remember to tell someone or write to us and please keep those testimonies coming in. We had another testimony this week of somebody whose foot was completely healed through the online service of a long-standing ailment. So please keep letting us know, give the glory to God because he is the healer, he's the saviour and he's our soon returning king. Well, once again, we come to a conclusion, but we are so glad that you could join us today. We love you. We pray that you have an awesome week and we pray that we see you again in great health next week. And remember, Jesus is the solution to every problem. He's the key to every locked door and he's given you his authority, his power, his name and his glory and his righteousness and a free access and open welcome to heaven. So let's live for him this week. But until next week, this is Dave and Rosanna from the Eternity Online Service saying, Bye. Bye.